I'm very honored to be up here co-presenting with someone who very much inspires me and how I think about the whole body, the whole terrain. So a little bit of back, our background. We got the great introduction from Rand, so thank you so much. Um, but basically, uh, a couple things just so you know, because we cover so much information today, we want you to know that there's places for you to gather more information and to keep, keep track of us, because we're gonna be doing a lot of trainings and cool things in the near future. So, this is where I begin with every single person that I work with, okay? My uh, 25 plus years in the field of integrative oncology has brought me into understanding 10 main things that drive a cancering or chronic illness process. So I have likened it to, the, a, book, uh, to a, a big bucket, which you can think of as your mitochondria, and the different things that play into that bucket, the drops of water that fall into that bucket are anything from the microbiome, which we're gonna spend time talking about today, um, stress response and circadian rhythms, metabolic flexibility, so glucose response, hormones, mental emotional things, all of these things add to our bucket at any given time. So when you're talking about cancer, um, the room usually goes wah, wah, wah. Um, we have to talk about the bad news before we get to the solutions and start talking about what we can do to change the terrain. So I'm gonna start with some pretty scary statistics. As you can see up here, by 2030, our cancer rates are expected to double. In this room alone, half of you will likely have cancer in your lifetime. A couple other stats to let them sink in is that just a few months ago in the EU, we now have 12 countries that have cancer as the leading cause of death. That is the first time ever in human history, and we're expected to match that statistic by 2020. If you've had cancer, your likelihood of having a recurrence is 70%. So this is why we're having these types of conversations today. I want you to not be that statistic. Let me throw a few more gloom and doom ones out there as we're gonna talk about, and it'll help you understand why these statistics are so prevalent today, is that 80% of all childhood cancers, people who've had cancer in their, in their youth, will have another cancer in their lifetime. That's pretty horrific. And then also the fastest growing rate of colorectal cancer and glioblastomas are in the 25-year-old crowd and younger. And we're also seeing a huge, huge resurgence in leukemia and lymphoma and childhood cancers. Now hopefully, this room, I'm preaching a little bit to the choir here, literally, you guys look like you're in a choir, um, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that we can change this and we know the drivers of this. And so we're speaking among colleagues and peers here who can help us get this message out and change these dire statistics. Um, and also, if you want to look at the slides, if you go to the Gut Institute under media presentations, um, all our slides are currently loaded up there. Um, and we're going to pull some of the Q&A. So um, if we run a little bit over, we're going to go to Nisha's uh, book signing after, and all the Q&A can follow us over there as well. So I just want to let you know, know that so you don't worry. So I, I work with clients on gut. It started off with gut and heart disease. And then it turns out now, uh, precancer cancer. And I always like to look at the footprint, the footprint of the footprint of chronic disease and cancer. And when I quiz my clients, I look. I turned out Nation and I we had so much in common. When I, when I and then I started just following her all over and stalking her because we do exactly the same thing, whether it's for GI tract or cancer or chronic disease. And when I quiz my clients, it turns out they've had issues ongoing for years, if not decades, or even since they were a child. And then they present with two or three autoimmune diseases or severe brain fog or they've recovered from a cancer or two or three. Um, so you kind of get the story. So I love talking about poo, <laughs> as you know. Um, and one of the first things I ask them, you know, is does it smell, you know, what does it look like? How often do you go? And one of the cases we're gonna go over at the end, uh, one was a superstar pooer, okay. But when we quiz longer, you know, it was never per Bristol 4. And Bristol 4 is the perfect poo, where you have one wipe off the toilet paper, doesn't smear the bowl and it doesn't smell very much. It smells like compost, kind of like our, you know, our farms and farm animal, happy farm animals. Um, but we have lots of statistics. If it's either loose stools or constipation. So the other case we're going to go over, she had three cancer. Uh, this case had three cancers by the age of 19, and it was reported um, uh, a stool a bowel movement, constipated bowel movement, maybe once a month. So. 
tying it in with uh. irritable bowel syndrome, which is such an epic uh, condition right now, both in kids, teens, and uh, adults, there's a high, huge link, and many studies are showing this, for colorectal and rectum cancer, a, a big association with IBS is 51%. For liver tr uh, cancer and biliary tract cancer, 40% associated with IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, whether it's, co uh, whether it's constipation dominant or diarrhea constant. Uh, diarrhea const uh, dominant, sorry. Um, pancreatic cra uh, cancer, which is highly on the rise, 56%, and kidney, 56%. Breast cancer, um, which is so, we're seeing so much prevalence in, in our ladies, is also associated, of course. Almost every cancer, when I drilled it down, it was. So having more motility means um, less risk, as much as 46% protection compared to once a day stooling. That was kind of a blow away moment for me. Because uh, uh, even our best poopers don't don't do once a day. I mean, they, they do once a day, but not more than once a day, without um, bionic fiber or something like that. Okay. And then people who report rare constipation, um, much less risk. So more even so, having much less constipation co compared to once a week. And of course, with GI tract uh, conditions like benign colorectal neoplasm and colorectal cancer, there's a huge risk with chronic uh, constipation, with a relative risk increase of 59% for colorectal and then with neoplasms as much as 2.6 fold. <laughs> so why? Okay, now again, in this room, most of you know the why, but it's important to point out because there's a lot of people who will be watching this in the future that this might be the first time they're hearing this information. So before we go into the why, I wanna bring a few more uh, pieces of statistics to the, to the forefront to realize also that every single one of us in this room has cancer right now. But the key is that our bodies know how to keep it in check, or they should. And when it goes out of bounds is when we have problems. So again, right now, one in eight women, and probably related to the poo um, piece here, will have cancer in their lifetime. But also just to know, if you're a woman over 50, you have a 50% chance of already having microscopic breast cancer cells on, on biopsy. If you're a male over 50, the same is true for prostate cancer. If you're over 70, 100% of people over 70 have microscopic thyroid cancer cells, okay? So please, I tell you that bad news to realize that we're, most of us are walking around with it, but it's not causing a problem right now. So how can we further avoid this? Well, what brought us here are a few key factors, major, major farming changes, okay? Major especially, I mean, we started making big changes in the 1850s, but we made major changes since the 1970s when we introduced things like glyphosate, which we'll go into a little more detail about what that causes here in a bit, but also antibiotics in the 1940s, triclosan, um, a whole slew of other wonderful inventions to make our lives easier in the modern times. But that modern time is not congruent, not synergistic with our ancient microbiome. Our physiology and our anatomy has not changed that much over the past several hun you know, hundred thousand years. But here we are that we are trying to kind of overlay our modern lifestyle on an ancient microbiome. So uh, many, again, in this room know this story, but we've had kind of four major iterations of human you know, creation. So what is so fascinating to me is that when you take a look at the poop fossils, that's a thing, and the dental cavities, uh, dental calcifications of this population, these four populations listed up here, we have the highest microbial diversity in the hunter-gatherer group and the least diverse in the industrial food revelation, revolution group, revelation as well. Um, and so those main changes, as you can see here, 10,000 years ago before we moved into the Neolithic farming is where we saw one big change. We started to move from fat burners to carbohydrate burners, to, to sugar burners. Now, fast forward another 9,500 or you know, 9,900 years is when we get to the time where we think it's a good idea to start to process the sugar and flour in our world. So think about how far that had gone and suddenly we're exploding with really processed sugars where in, 19, in the 1850s we were averaging five pounds of sugar per person per year and in 2014 we're at 175 pounds of sugar per person per year. So hopefully that's showing you that lack of diversity and that metabolic inflexibility is really a big problem. And then when we start to add the things like the wonderful invention of antibiotics that took us from the pendulum of dying of infections to where we started to get to in the last you know, 50 years of dying from inflammation, 
Well, this morning, one of the speakers talked about, um, I think it was Guillermo, talked about how we're swinging back to the pendulum of dying infections again. And so that pendulum is swinging wildly. And so that's where we are trying to help address that and talk about that. When I look at the gut microbiome, both Nation and I, we run the sim similar testing. We use, my, uh, in, uh, we use functional integrative medicine testing. We culture the stool. We look at the urine organic acids because we can really see what's coming out um, from the gut because often you can't tell because the colon's only one and a half meters of stool. Really, we, we want to see what's going on in the small intestines. Um, in, in Japan, they do much research on the gut microbiome, especially babies and adults, and a, a group of bacteria known as bifido. I call this as one of the integral parts of our ABCs. They combat the bad bacteria. And I don't want to give a bad label, but proteobacteria is generally kind of where we see a lot of the pathogens. So the deforestation that Nasha talks about is what we see in the gut now in all kinds of gut testing. And this lack of the ABCs, A is acromantia, B is the bifidobacterium, it leads to overgrowth. So what studies from Japan and other uh, really uh, prominent gut researchers show is that babies are born with bifido. And this is actually the immune system from mom because they have no innate, no adaptive immunity at the time. It's bifido that protects them. And every gut flora that um, shows up on baby in the beginning has a role, even the E. coli. Where does the E. coli come from on baby? So E. coli is part of proteobacteria, and it's uh, um, also Klebsiella. These are all proteo. And they cover the baby in the beginning, um, ear, nose, throat, all the way through. Where does it come from? Poo. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shocked. It's lovely, especially if it's, you know, Dr. Grace, you know, Bristol for poo. Um, and the bifido protects the baby. And as we age, by three years old, the E. coli and proteo, they've gone down. And the reason is they serve a really great role. They eat up the oxygen, and then they create that anaerobic vacuum known as the butt, no, <laughs> where we can actually be fermenters and co composters, right? <laughs> and so then the uh, facultative um, uh, bacteria like the A's, bifido, and, um, and then lacto, and then the C's, um, they can uh, play into prominence. So when I look at a lot of studies now, all the ABCs are gone. It's terrible. So it's like mom's legacy has not gone down to the baby. And if we were all cars, it'd be like getting a car without a wheel. So let's say you get a car donated by, you know, Uncle John or Auntie Stella. It's like, thanks, you gave me a Tesla, but it's missing three wheels. <laughs> so now we're seeing all the disease, diseases of aging because of the deforestation of the gut and loss of all these functional modules that all, as humans and other mammals on Earth and even insects and birds and boa constrictors, none of us make, do a lot of work. Our bacteria do it, right? This is the uh, evolution on Earth for the last four billion years. So now we're seeing first time in, on Earth, uh, diseases of chronic conditions are affecting even our children, and they're dying before even the parents or the grandparents. So I come back to constipation just because how many of you had constipation before going paleo and ancestral in your diet? I know, oh, it's like on. usually a couple, it's usually like a third. <laughs> <laughs> So finally, we have full genome sequence, full, full shotgun uh, genome sequencing for looking at what is going on in a constipated butt. And usually they're missing, all the, um, they're missing a lot of the anti-inflammatory um, geniuses like A, B, and Cs. Actually, for this study, it was uh, bacter uh, bacteroides and the Fecalibacterium, which is part of Clostridiolus C. Um, and when I, when Nation and I look at studies, we are looking for the overgrowths. Where are the viral overgrowths? What are they? Is it EBV, HPV, HHV6, Barvo? And what pathogens are we dealing with? What parasites? What worms? Is it Klebsiella, Citrobacter? All these are associated with multiple conditions, uh, cancer, chronic diseases, autoimmunity. And what this study was really awesome is the first one um, where they uh, looked at the loss of functions. There were about 50 functional groups that were uh, different in constipation versus healthy controls. One of the main ones is there was a lot of hydrogen production, methane production, of course, and loss of something called glycerol, or, or too much, uh, not enough glycerol. And uh, we even use glycerol suppositories for constipation, right? But the main one was actually loss of this function that our gut microbiome did called metho methylglyoxal degradation. And without it, there's oxalates. And you probably heard a talk earlier today by Sally Turner that was amazing about oxalates. The funny thing is most societies on Earth that are long living, like the National Geographic Longevity um, Group and Centenarians, they eat a very, very high oxalate diet. The paleo diet is super fucking high oxalates. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so what do we do when we have this loss of function? And how did it happen? You know, where, where did the deforestation start to occur? So with, you know, this is why we're here to figure it out, but antibiotics certainly play a role, stress. A lot of uh, practitioners are in the, uh, in the room. Many of you did residency. 
killed your adrenals, killed your gut, <laughs> no sleep, <laughs> long call, short calls, right? Uh, moms, right? No sleep, take care of two, three, four babies. <laughs> um, executives, travel, jet lag, right? So we, you know, we all have some state of some deforestation because that's the Western world. Oxalates are a big deal. They're highly associated with cancer. They actually, in some studies, they say they induce cancer. When we're doing a mammogram, what are we looking at? Calcium oxalate before it turns to hydroxyapatite. And hydroxyapatite's bone, and that's um, shown that malignant tumors are usually more of the, uh, they've transformed to this bone already. And bone doesn't belong in boobs, right? So okay. how do we prevent this? Do we just uh, go all low, low oxalate and don't eat superfood kale? So there's um, a lot of studies, and we started doing uh, protocols for oxalates um, a couple years ago, and they worked so successfully. And we want to look at the terrain that nature talks about because mercury, copper, all these heavy metals, th when they complex with oxalates, they become glass fortresses, shards of glass, and you can't break them down. Um, mercury oxalates 100,000 times more insoluble than magnesium. Magnesium is super soluble, and that's why we love magnesium and la magnesium citrate for our, our protocols. So even GI docs now are, are understanding that chronic constipation is just a sign of the microbiome and probably epigenetic and oxidative stress. So I love Nisha, when we found each other, like I just loved her concept because it's no tumor board, let's talk about the terrain. And that's exactly what I've been really uh, looking at too. And how do we change the terrain in the easiest way possible? And, and then how do we get people happy, healthy, and whole again? So here's the bacterial microbiome. Um, probably many of you are familiar with a lot of these strains now when I talk about them. You know, some of the stats earlier that we were 10 to one bacterial, right? Um, now it's like five to one, three to one, two to one, one to one. So if we're half hybrid, <laughs> Don't you want the better version? Like, you want the best half of your half, right? You want the best version, version 3.0, 4.0. You don't want to be downgraded by your bacteria, for sure. And if you're missing them, let's, let's bring them back. Let's replenish them and restore function and all the functional modules, including oxalate degradation. And we can do that. And we have so many tools. I'm so grateful for Nisha and her training for white, for white mistletoe and the tools in functional medicine, because we can do this, and especially with pr uh, probiotics and prebiotics. So another terrain we don't look at is vio vi uh, vi the biome, viral microbiome, um, the viral terrain, and the mycobiome, which is mycology or fungal uh, terrain. And this often becomes a big picture, especially after antibiotics or stress or C-section or formula, as I mentioned earlier. And we want to look at these because these are actually sources of exogenous oxalates. This is actually not a widely known thing. So if we have a lot of aspergillus, saccharomyces, and uh, candida overgrowth. Guess where the oxalates come from? From these critters. And so we can change the terrain if they're off and just bring back um, harmony again. So after just dis uh, disruption, um, today, uh, this weekend, Nation and I are staying at a house, and previously, um, before the owners bought it, there were hoarders that lived there. So imagine your house being a hoarder. Like, would you allow all that garbage? And, or like right now, there's fires sometimes put out. Like poor Seattle, we're dealing with all this smog and smoke right now. Sometimes there's fires to put out. And when, we're, when there's smoke, we, we try to get to the source. So when we're missing the ABCs and all the symbiont flora, this is, is what happens. And all these are known carcinogens. They're just as bad as asbestos, radon, or mercury. And oxalates is one of the big ones. So how do we clean up this terrain? And before we talk, kind of do an overview of the points to drive home in this first section here, is when she talked about the importance of the virome and their microbiome, just in another statistic, because I like to throw these out to freak you out a little bit and make sure you're awake after lunch, 200,000 cases of Epstein-Barr virus caused cancer worldwide every year. And we don't talk about that, okay? HPV, you know, we've got all these vaccines, by the way, those don't do anything because it's working on just a few strains and it's not changing the terrain. In fact, it's likely making it worse. And so what we're also seeing now is HPV of any strain, vaccinated or not, has a higher risk of things like cervical cancer, obviously we know about, head and neck cancers, but many people don't realize it's also a real driver of ovarian cancer. That happens to be a population that I spend the majority of my time with. Um, so just in the take home message here, there's no one thing ever. There's no one cure, there's no one cause. The terrain is everything. So keep thinking about that bucket, especially start looking into your own bucket so you don't become that statistic of being half the people in this room getting cancer or have already had cancer in your lifetime. Remember the changes we've made in a relatively short period of time from moving from the hunter-gatherer all the way up to our post-industrial food revolution 
And then it's so important that this is why Grace has become a dear, dear friend, is that we're simply a tube with a body wrapped around it. And we need to be tending to that tube a lot because basically you are what you don't poop. Okay, and then again to reiterate when you don't poop you change your microbiome balance But you also change your metabolic balance and so moving from fat burners to sugar burners to damaging of our mitochondria Which is the foundation of all chronic illness today? Um, and then again, we've covered the gloom and doom. I could get a little bit of bum 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 We're gonna go into a little bit of hope So here's that image again Maybe you can take a little bit deeper look at this bucket now that it has a little different context for you to realize that there's not one thing to look at and don't get seduced by the idea of one treatment or one answer to this either. That can be just as dangerous. So start digging in your own buckets, okay? That's a biggie. Um, each and every one of us have our own chemically, biochemically, individual, epigenetic, emo emotional, life experience that is overlaid what goes into that bucket, and so it should also be addressed as such. So after microbiome or fungal um, biome disruption, we often see insulin resistance. And if you look on this slide, the red is, they're all metabolites of bacteria. Often they're the pathogenic ones. And not only do they make phenol, cresol, ammonia, and uh, hydrogen and methane gases, but they make all kinds of other you know, great fun things. They also make good things. So these are the blue. And this is why it's so important we cultivate our terrain, just like a wonderful garden. Um, I think of microbial amplification. We, we can become the best versions of ourselves as human beings when we have our counterpart, our microbial counterpart, as fine-tuned as, as a car. Um, and as, as you guys all bring in your car probably every year, right, for tune-up or gas change, or actually I don't do my oil change very often. <laughs> don't tell them that. <laughs> so now we have dashboards. Uh, both Nation and I use pretty similar labs, and I'm expanding like, to a lot of the labs she uses. Um, and I know uh, Rob Wolf with Wired to Eat. I mean, there's so many metabolic markers that we can now look at or simple you know, uh, testing that we can even do on our own with direct labs. It's amazing. And there's a company I work with now consulting, it's called Viome. Uh, we test quarterly, and uh, you can see full genome sequencing of your whole microbiome, including the fungal elements, the viral, and the bacterial. It's totally new, it's really awesome. And we look at all the organic acids and proteomics and meta meta metabolomics right now. We can pick up signatures even before um, the diseases happen. So as you're fixing your metabolic and restoring uh, metabolic flexibility, the way I kind of think of what Nisha does in her book, the metabol her new metabolic approach to cancer book, um, is that there's this, uh, a surgery that fixes diabetes, like immediately reverses diabetes, and people who are morbidly obese, they lose 50 to 100 pounds usually after the first year. Um, they looked at the microbiome and the changes. So the surgery is called Rowan Y uh, Gastric Bypass, but it's a lot like some of the strategies that Nisha uses. So I thought I'd go really quick, but basically they, they, they restore um, microbial diversity. N these they looked at, in this study, they looked at 13 morbidly obese uh, uh, patients who underwent this uh, really gas, uh, ghastly kind of surgery where they're um, yeah, r uh, connecting up part of the small intestines. They cut part of the small intestines, so this is why I think it's kind of effective. You have both small intestinal fungal overgrowth and SIBO being excised from there and then shortening the stomach. But they immediately see um, uh, diversity and they see a B, the bif bifobacterium dentium. They see the a, B, a and B and another B called allostypes, it's a bacteroides, come up in prominence and it's uh, statistically significant to how much better they are for insulin sensitivity. Also, they're able to restore GABA. So a lot of our, um, the two cases we're gonna go over, they have GABA uh, mutations, just known as GAD1, it's a lot like my clients. I work with executives, multitasking moms, MMA fighters, endurance athletes, uh, and some physicians and um, healthcare uh, practitioners. Everyone's addicted. They're addicted to their lifestyle, <laughs> to being super great, A, 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 a superstars. They don't have gab much GABA though. GABA comes from our gut flora. Just like serotonin comes from our gut flora, and then we make melatonin. Are we all deficient of Kirk Parsley's sleep cocktail, which has <laughs> GABA in it, pharma GABA, which is from bacteria? So this study was awesome. By doing a metabolic approach, some of the nation's approaches, there's higher GLP-1, higher GABA, and higher glutathione, all super great for reversing cancer and chronic diseases. So I love this. So they re improve satiety, redu reduce inflammation, and all of it was statistically associated with the A and the B. Wow. So We've thrown a lot of data at you in this first half of the presentation. And so I wanna just highlight a case that kind of 
helps you understand how the entire bucket can get so full so fast. So likely a lot of these symptoms up here resonate with you or people that you know or people that you work with in your own practices. Um, but basically, this person started in the world um, with a mom who smoked during pregnancy, formula fed, allergic to every single formula except for they finally settled on soy. Um, in the future, loads of colic. This is the patient she talked about with pooping once a month, but the pediatrician said that's normal because at least there's, you know, once a month poopers. I mean, it's like they're consistently once a month, so that somehow that was fine. This person also had a 10 out of 10 ACE score. How many of you here are familiar with the ACE score? Thank you. So that's the adverse childhood events. And basically for every um, over two events before the age of 18, um, your incidence of having chronic illness or cancer as an adult go up by 20% each one above there. So pretty much a given that that person was gonna end up with cancer at some point. And they did, um, three times to be exact, before they turned 20 years old. Um, two of the times are, are related to HPV was cervical cancer, so the virome was clearly off. And when their stage four ovarian um, terminal diagnosis came at the age of 19, you can tell that the bucket was overflowing with a lot of goo. Okay, so important to know this. Also later on in their lives, they found out that they carried the BRCA gene issues, which makes them difficult to deal with a lot of methylation processes, as well as some issues around com t SNPs, so the way they dealt with stress and hormones in the world, and multiple other factors that we've found with functional testing over the years. While I'm on this page, I think it's important to point out a few correlations for you to understand how you could take this into your own practices or into yourself. So for instance, a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome or fibrocystic breasts, you have a much higher incidence of ovarian cancer. Um, if you were exposed to secondhand smoke, even thirdhand smoke, your incidence goes up even higher. Um, the constipation piece related to pretty much all the cancers, the ACE scores we've already covered, root canals, that's a big one. Start doing your research there. BRCA and radiation, here's a methylating genetic hiccup that is provoked by more radiation. And what do we start doing to this population? We radiate them at least twice a year. Please stop smashing and radiating those bony boobs um, because that will turn on the BRCA mutations that much more. Amalgams, um, all the, my, all the um, mercury is driving the glyphosate. Um, it, or is, well, it's interacting with the glyphosate, driving the oxalates, but it also stimulates estrogen. Um, in a big, big way. And if you've got calm t snips then that means you are likely not going to process it very well and store it up inappropriately and let it become a proliferator to places in your body that shouldn't be proliferating. And then one other piece to highlight about this particular person in the next case we're gonna talk about is the undercurrent that I see pretty much 100% of the time in all of my patients dealing with cancer or chronic illness is the deficiency of six main nutrients. And that is zinc, selenium, magnesium, B12, vitamin D, and vitamin K2. So guess where I also saw that population, those same lab values coming from my vegan and vegetarian patients as well. That person was also a long-term vegan and vegetarian at the time. She was already three years into that at the time of her terminal diagnosis. So these are important things that I wanted you to be thinking about in the bigger picture of what could be in the bucket of the people you're working with. And then the next case kind of builds on that. Uh, it's a very similar parallel case and a, a lot with other clients um, that I see. Mother had um, gut issues, known gut issues, um, IBS. The birth was unusual, a lot, uh, lot of probably likely antibiotics, but anesthesia. And the case was very healthy until IV antibiotics and some steroids, although they, it, the, those are probably very helpful and prevented being um, amputated or something worse. Um, so th this case is very similar to all my clients. Um, courses of um, antibiotics for UTI, colds, acne, uh, uh, with dental work and um, a surgery, um, a long history of Hashimoto's and being um, overweight, and the, and the normal, you know, mercury exposure with um, people have usually, you know, several amalgams, um, and uh, testing ended up being at one point of a critical acute health, um, there is IgG testing that was all positive. And then standard food allergies. Um, in, our, in our population, I, I like to have my um, clients finally challenge their food, and usually in four to six months, they can start liberalizing, or even in one or two months, they start liberalizing really quickly, um, especially for oxalates, or if they're allergic to other things, salicylates, phenols. I challenge all my clients to eat gluten and dairy in four to six months, because we have probiotics, like our Bifo Maximus, we'll go over, I'm gonna go over in a second, which restores that ability to break down uh, mycotoxins, gluten, and casein. So this case was really uh, common, and it, 
uh, we see same SNPs. Uh, this cl uh, client had the FUT2, the ATG, 16L1, COMP, CAD1 that I mentioned earlier, CYP1B1, which breaks down estrogens, um, MAO, which allows a lot of adrenaline, which turns on pathogens in the MTHFR. So why we wanted to show you those examples of cases is because a lot of you see them or live with them yourself. But we also wanted to show you an example of those cases because you're looking at those two cases right now. And so to be standing up here with 25, actually October 21st will be 26 years out from that case history, the first one, um, that would be me. And understanding how to start playing in my own uh, bucket and start to assess and analyze and change that, a lot of that goes back to my naturopathic roots of dealing with the essential determinants of health. Most of us are not being exposed to the essential determinants of health on a regular basis. Do you realize just in the 1950s, we had an average of four hours a day of sun that we were outdoors? Today, 15 minutes is the average of how much time we spend outdoors. Holy cow. So when we're indoors, what are we under? All those crazy lights that are major mitochondrial poisons. So I think Dave Asprey calls it the high fructose corn syrup, um, the light inside our homes these days. But these are the types of things we are so disconnected from the natural rhythms of life that part of what I find in the sickest buckets, myself included, was being more and more and more and further and further and further away from our original ancestral processes, okay? That's huge. So the real dirt on cancer is we need outdoor time and dirt and dirt bacteria and playing in the dirt and allowing our kids to play in the dirt and our pets should play in the dirt. So I really want to um, stress how we can be completely microbial enhanced, have superpowers. Um, when our microbes are doing everything for us, if especially if the whole complement is there, and we can do that now. Even if we're missing big chunks, we can revive them, res resurrect them. Um, I see it in my clients all the time when we do repeat testing, um, yeah, biome or, um, or even U-biome or s the and the CDSA or GI effects. We can see the strains come up again, the A, B, and X. So th the case earlier was me and um, th that I was able to resurrect many strains, uh, including the ABCs on oxalates were at one point such a problem, a lot of body aches, fibromyalgia, um, loss, uh, 50 pounds one time and another 20 pounds another time, uh, so collectively 70, I guess. Um, but all things are possible. Our, the hope from our talk today is just that, that you are aware that so many solutions are possible um, right now. We have all the tools, um, whether it's mistletoe for, um, as an intervention or mushrooms or gut protocols. Um, everything helps to redirect that terrain, and we can reestablish all the populations that back to an ancestral template as they were before, without a poop transplant also, <laughs> by Thank the way. You. And part of the mi microbial metabolites that are so protective, they come from our food, from plants. So we are, we are directly connected to plants. Um, e coli was found to be found in all our bodily fluids, so protective for all our gonads, brain, and um, organs. It comes from a, a legume, as, and it's microbial enhanced by our gut flora. And white mistletoe, which Nisha does all the training for, I've gone to several of the trainings, and uh, I have clients on it, um, it's fermented. Some of our most powerful brews including ale and beer, no, um, and kombucha and um, other powerful foods, um, they're, they're made microbially better and they're preserved as well. So these are other things that come from our gut and um, I I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of these already, but we also can check some of these right now on testing. So I'd love to share a really um, amazing story which changed both Nisha's um, practice and mine. Um, I had actually formulated the Ultra Bifo Maximus already pri prior to this coming out, almost as a premonition. But this study compared a, a strong PD-1 drug, uh, it's an anti-tumor drug, for, for initially for melanoma. Um, is everyone familiar with Jimmy Carter? And yeah, so, um, but the, the drug has a lot of adverse effects, including death. There's black box warnings, organ failure, colitis, many, many gut problems. Um, they found by putting, they, they had two types of rats, uh, mice, um, uh, taconic rats and Jackson rats, and m mice, sorry. Yeah. And they couldn't tell why um, the taconic rats um, were having uh, less um, uh, efficacy compared to Jacks. And then when they um, looked at their gut microbiome, they figured out there were 257 different taxa that were different. And when they drilled it down, they looked at all permutations. There was a group of bacteria uh, of bifido that was 400 times more pronounced in the uh, animals, the rodents, that actually had tumor regression. And this was efficacy as good as a drug with no side effects that the researchers note. And when they drilled it further, there was a P of 0 0.0019 and um, it was a group of bifido, known as bifido longum and bifido brevae. 
And when they co-housed the animals, they found that actually this was abrogated. You know why? They ate each other's poo, so then it got the inferior well, poo. That's what we can do after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Natural PD-1 inhibitor. Yeah. Perfect. And these strains, they actually break down oxalates. Oh. They protect the gut flora. What they found when they tested further is that they induce signals. So our bacteria are just like Twitter. You don't want to screw your Twitter. <laughs> you want them totally um, putting out the right signals. Right. And the signals that um, the bifidolongum and the Brevet put out were signals to the lymph nodes so that they'd be tumor draining and basically infiltrating like a little pet piranha, infiltrating the tumor and erasing it. So we have all the tools at our um, fingertips to actually um, help chronic disease and uh, cancer. And so on that, because I know we've got about 30 seconds um, to go on this, in those places where foods like, or the bifidum is so huge as a natural PD-1 inhibitor, a ketogenic diet is also considered a PD-1 inhibitor, a checkpoint inhibitor. These are some of the tools that brought, restored a lot of my function, cleaned out my bucket and that of tens of thousands of the clients I've worked with over the years in some form or fashion. We go into great detail about this in the book. We could even go into each section of the bucket as its entire own hour. And so we're gonna kind of flow through these last two because we are over at this well, point. Well, the slides from the website. But basically, and we've talked about all these pieces of how we're going to get that rhythm restored, get the teeter-totter back into balance. But to leave you with these thoughts that we are all, again, biochemically individual, emotionally individual, epigenetically individual, it is so important. We don't have to guess anymore. So we want you to be test, assess, and address what's going on in that bucket. Biohack your life, folks. Start with that tube. And to learn more, please um, hunt us down. We loaded this up with a lot of references to let you just keep going down the rabbit hole here. Um, and we'll see you off the break um, over at the book section. Thank you. Thanks so much for attending today. That's hard to do it to you, right on. Thank you so much, Anne.